My name is Donetta Bailey Reed, and I am a Historical Society member and also a chairman of, of the uh, Cemetery Walk. And I have lived in Hamilton County since 1954. And uh, I have uh, recently went to uh, four different cemetery walks in Polk County and was very excited because I went in not knowing any person buried there and came out wanting to know more. And I brought this idea back to the Historical Society here in McLeansboro. And everyone was enthused about it because we wanted to get uh, the uh, point across that uh, there was a lot of uh, people buried here that were founders and helped to form Clainsboro. So first we had to get volunteers. We asked for people in the public and in the society members. And we got people to come forth and to portray. And the, last year we had six, this year we have ten. We had to do research and we went out to the oldest part of the cemetery and we chose people not by who was famous or their name, but by location and the year that they passed away, preferably in the 1800s. And then from there, um, they started looking to see if they could find information in the genealogy, genealogy department and uh, through uh, local people that had contacts. And with this research, we were able to um, uh, get enough information to portray someone. If there wasn't, then we went back out of the cemetery and we chose another uh, person. Then they did the research, they, they did their uh, format for the person they were going to portray, and then we started uh, having meetings and getting volunteers. Uh, we had uh, transportation, um, we had uh, went to Paducah, to Creatures of Habit, got costumes fitting that time era for that person, and then we had the cemetery walk. And we hoped that we uh, uh, would, the information that we provided would get people interested to join the society and to understand of what type of people and the kind of people that were buried there who contributed to the founding uh, uh, of McLeansboro and to draw interest and hopefully the people will become members. And now it's on to the cemetery walk. My name is Thomas Wilder and I was born in the United Kingdom. Shortly after arriving in America, I placed an ad in the Maryland newspaper for any member of the Grand United Order of Oddfellows Friendly Society. After speaking with many great men, we came together and formed the First Lodge in America on April 26, 1819, in Baltimore, Maryland, naming it Washington Lodge Number 1. Today we are known as the Independent Order of Oddfellows. The command of the Independent Order of Oddfellows is to visit the sick, relieve the distressed, bury the dead, and educate the orphans. Specifically, Independent Order of Eye Fellowship is dedicated to the following purposes. To improve and elevate the character of mankind by promoting the principles of friendship, love, truth, faith, hope, charity, and universal justice. To help make the world a better place to live by aiding each other in times of need, the community, the less fortunate, the youth, the elderly, the environment, and the community in every way possible. To promote goodwill and harmony amongst peoples, nations, through the principle of university, universal fraternity, holding the behalf that all men and women regard less of race, nationality, religion, social status, gender, rank, and station are brothers and sisters. On September 20th, 1851, the International Order of Oddfellows became the first national fraternity to accept both men and women when it formed the Daughters of Rebecca. I, Shiler Koflax, was the force behind the movement. Around the world, the Oddfellows undertake various community and charitable projects. Our organizational work includes spending over 
there's 775 million in relief projects annually. Our educational foundation provides substantial loans and grants to students. The SOS Children's Village provides a caring home for orphan children in 132 countries around the world. Our Opfos and Rebecca homes provide a place for the elderly. The Living Legacy focuses on planting trees and enhancing the environment. We also have the Ars Vitus Foundation. Our Visual Research Foundation supports vision care and research through the Wilmer Eye Institute. The United Nations Pilgrimage of Youth sponsors a group of students for an educational trip to the United Nations. Our annual sponsorship of a float in the Rose Parade in Pasadena, California, the International Order of Odd Fellows is the longest running organization to sponsor a float and has won more first place prizes than any other organization at the event. We sponsor an annual pilgrimage to the Tomb of the Unknown. Hubfo and Rebecca Camps and Parks provide rec recreation for youth and their families. Fellowship in the Independent Order of Odd Fellows entails one of the strongest fraternal societies around the world, a great worldwide united brotherhood, a fraternity founded on the basis of brotherhood, based on the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, founded on the North American continent in 1819, based upon the purest principles of equality, non-political and non-secretarian, a source of comfort in times of trouble and adversity, a worldwide force that stands for all that is noblest and highest, an everyday guide for conduct, a mantle that should be worn always, an organization that favors no person for their wealth and frowns on none for poverty, an ideal that exists in the heart and mind of every genuine odd fellow or Rebecca, fulfilling a mission in the world which no other institution can, has successfully attempted. A vitalizing, sympathetic, and actuating influence in the lives of all of its members. A ministering spirit helping the needy, cheering the despondent, and protecting the helpless. The handmaid of virtue and religion. Founded on the inspired word of God, as revealed to man in the Holy Scriptures. On behalf of the Independent Order of Odd Fellows, the noble grand brother Buddy Badgett, in the Brothers of Hamilton Lodge, number 191, we welcome you to our cemetery and enjoy your walk through history. Hello, everyone. Thanks for stopping by. This is your first stop on your cemetery walk today. Let me introduce myself. My name is Elnora Blades Lidbetter, otherwise, most people know me as Nora. I was born in 1860 here in Hamilton County to James M. Blades and Elsie Lockwood Blades. And my grandfather on my mother's side was Jesse C. Lockwood, who was one of the founding fathers of this county. When this county first started, he was elected to fill every county office but one, and that was the judge. And he was the county clerk, the county treasurer, the city, the circuit clerk, the recorder, postmaster, sheriff, and justice of the peace. And he also kept a store. But even with all that, he wasn't busy with about half the time, so he did a little farming on the side. Now, if he happened to be out working in his cornfield when someone came by and wanted to do business in one of his many offices, they'd just take his place out in the cornfield, and then he'd go take care of their business, and then he'd come back and relieve them. That's just the way it was back then. He also had the first frame house in the county. All the others were logged before that. His house was located up on the southeast corner of the square. Yeah, we were proud of Grandpa. He was a very hardworking man and well respected. 
I was one of 12 children. Only 11 grew to adulthood, but that was still quite a houseful. You might remember my sister Emma, who married Chalen Guard Cloud. Chalen was president of the Hamilton County Bank for many years. The year after he died, it was renamed the Cloud State Bank. And I think I heard someone say it's called People's National Bank now. But he and Emma lived down on South Washington Street in a large three-story brick house. I always told them I thought it looked like a castle with those rounded towers on the corners. But she kept it decorated so beautifully, and I used to love to visit with them. And this house is now located on the National Register of Historic Sites. And my brother, Samuel Marshall Blades, or S.M. Blades as he was known, ran a music store up on the square. And he sold pianos and organs and all kinds of musical instruments. One thing about my brother, though, he couldn't make up his mind on which side of the square to have his store, so he just kept moving around until he found the one he liked. So he started out on the east side of the square with a combination of a grocery store and a music store. A couple years later, he moved to the south side of the square. About three years later, he moved to the west side of the square. Then he moved to the southeast corner of the square. And by this time, the music business had picked up so much that he... Uh, sold off the grocery part, and he just concentrated on the music part. And then he moved the music store to the north side of the square. He was there for about three years, and then he moved back to the southeast corner of the square, where he added a line of dry goods and ladies' uh, furnishings and hats, and that's where he stayed. And I thought that boy never would settle down. And in the first 12 years of his business, he sold 300 pianos and organs just in this county alone. It's not counting what he's sold outside the county. He's responsible for bringing a lot of music to our area. Um, in 1889, in the fall, I married Edward Whitey Ledbetter. Uh, we got married at the beautiful St. James Episcopal Church. And they had it all decked out in goldenrod and fall leaves and fall flowers. I don't laugh because we had to use whatever was available and goldenrod was very plentiful. It looked very pretty in those decorations around the church. We had a large crowd attend. It's a wonder they didn't all go home sneezing. But we had a beautiful wedding and then afterwards we went to a reception at my father's house. And I say my father's house because my mother had passed away the year before. I really missed having her at my wedding. Not having her at my wedding. But the next day we uh, left for a three week honeymoon. We took a tour of St. Louis and Peoria and Chicago and just had a grand time. We would have liked to stay longer, but Ed had to get back to his business. Ed and his brother in law, J.C. Asher, ran a uh, mercantile store up on the south side of the square. And they called it Asher and Ledbetter. I don't know why they didn't call it Ledbetter and Asher, but they didn't. Anyway, they started it in 1880, and it had grown to be one of the largest businesses in this part of the state. Here's an ad from 1889, which appeared on the front page of the McLeansville Times. And it says that they had dry goods, notions, clothing, boots, shoes, hats, caps, carpets, blood clothes, trucks, leases, groceries, and glassware, and stoneware, and they even had wagons and plows. They had so much stuff, it took two stores to hold it all. In fact, their motto was, if you don't see what you want, just ask for it. And they not only took cash, they would also trade for dried fruit and eggs and chickens and feathers. I used to love to shop there because I always got a discount being the owner's wife. Ed and I lived down on South Washington Street in a large three-story frame house. We had a little white picket fence around it, and it had vines growing up the side of the porch for shade, and I loved that house. And in the first five years of marriage, we filled it with three lively boys. Yes, we were happy then. Life was good. Up until that fateful day just before Thanksgiving in 1895 when Ed decided to go on a hunting trip with several of his friends out to Missouri and Arkansas. If the weather was good, they'd planned to stay for several weeks, but the weather didn't cooperate, so he came back early. 
poor Ed came down very sick after that. Doctors came out every day and did all they could to save him, but he passed away on December 13th. He was only 35 years old. The boys and I were devastated. Well, they gave him a nice funeral up at the Methodist Church. There was about 200 people attending because he was well known and well loved throughout the community. But they brought him out here and laid him to rest right over there. Then to make matters worse, a couple weeks later, the store caught fire and soon grew out of control and spread to a couple stores on either side and even got the a couple of houses behind the store. It was one of the worst fires in the world ever had. If it hadn't been for a heavy snowfall that day, it might have wiped out the whole south side of the square. A few weeks later, Mr. Asher moved his store to the east side of the square and just called it J.C. Asher. No more Asher and Ledbetter. So in just a few weeks' time, my whole world had turned upside down. I didn't know what I was going to do. It was rough. And with the help of my family and friends, I was able to raise my boys to be fine, outstanding men. And my oldest son, Gus, uh, became a broker and moved out to Washington State, where he married a uh, senator's daughter. But he always kept in touch with me on special days by calling or sending flowers. He was such a thoughtful boy, was my guess. But he did quite well out there, and when he died in 1970, he left $50,000 to our little hospital out here, and they were able to build a 20-bed wing with that money. They even named it after him. It's called the Gus E. Ledbetter Wing. And my youngest son, Leland, moved out to Indianapolis, Indiana, and became a railway mail clerk. He married a lovely girl, and they had a little girl named Mary. My middle son, James Dwight, never left the Plainsboro. He became an electrician and worked for the city. In fact, he worked his way up to become superintendent of the uh, light and water plant. He married Laura Bell Braden, and they had two children, Miriam and Jimmy, whom I love to spoil. And one day, tragedy struck that family. And one evening, Dwight was out working with a high voltage wire, and I guess he touched it wrong or something anyway, he was selected Killed him instantly. He was only 35 years old, just like his daddy. Right over there. I tried to help his family all I could since I'd been through the same thing about 30 years earlier. One thing that kept me going through the years was my church. I attended the Methodist church and it was known as a singing church and I loved to sing in the choir. I sang alto and it was, they told me I had a pretty good voice. Even after I got too old to participate, I still loved to listen to the hymns and the songs on the radio, and I'd harmonize along with them. The last two years of my life I spent with my sister Carrie in St. Louis. I got to see Leland more often then because his job brought him to St. Louis every week or so, and he'd always stop by to see me. I enjoyed those visits. But I passed away on October 24, 1935, at the age of 75. They brought me back here and laid me to rest next to my husband and my son. So that's the end of my story. Thanks so much for stopping by. And I think your next presenters are waiting for you right over there. Hello, I'm John Columbus Carner. I was born in 1857, just north of Point, where my father was pastor, my father William Carter, who's buried right over there, was pastor of the Paradise Prairie Baptist Church. With him being a minister, the family moved often, and we moved to Pinckneyville, and then we moved to Nashville after a while, and then in 1881, we moved to Hamilton County, where we was assigned to pastor the First Baptist Church here. family came from uh, Ireland and settled in Shawneetown. 
her great uncle John opened the first bank in the Illinois Territory in 1860. Her grandfather Daniel came to McLeansboro in 1826, and her father, John Walker Marshall, followed about 1830. He married Mary Lockwood. Mary was the daughter of Jesse C. Lockwood, one of the first settlers in Hamilton County. The Lockwoods, Marshalls, and Carpenters were prominent people, and they were instrumental in the growth and development of early McLeansboro. They built the first homes, and they donated their land and money for churches. They held just about every public office that you can name, including some state and federal offices. Daniel Marshall purchased this land from the government and later donated it to this cemetery. Mother's brother was with Colonel Gerson on his famous raid through Mississippi and in fact died shortly after that Civil War campaign. Father died when I was just two years old and mother taught school for about eight years. Then she married a Dalgren businessman, Alexander Strummer. He sold flour and all kinds of lumber. He also had nine children by his first wife. She had died. And uh, when mother married him, my sister Nellie and brother Eddie and I moved in with our grandfather Marshall. Grandmother Mary had died in 1858, and her foster sister, Emelina Pascal, had promised her that she would take charge of the family. She did that, and she cared for us, and she kept house for Grandfather Marshall until she died in 1886. I was living with them when J.C. and I married. We surprised everyone, didn't we? We got married um, at Grandfather Marshall's house. I was 18. He was 25. J.C.'s father performed the ceremony, and just our family was present at the wedding. But the next night, Grandfather Marshall threw a big party, and all of the elite of McLeansboro attended. There were two newspapers in McLeansboro at that time, The Leader and The Era, and each had an article about our surprise wedding. The and by the way, The Leader newspaper at the time said that Columbus has captured one of McLeansboro's most charming young ladies. And, given who her family was and the background, it can be said that old Columbus married very, very well. Like I said earlier, in 1881, our family moved to McLeansboro. And within a year, uh, I had gotten set up in the monument business and had married Bina. The Carter name remained on that monument business at 202 South Washington. That's right off the southwest corner of the square for 60 years until my death. For many years, our residence was at 512 East Market Street, up here by the Catholic Church. So what else did I do in the 60 years that I lived in McLeansboro? Well, first and foremost, I was very active in the First Baptist Church, where I was deacon and trustee and church clerk for many years. Uh, around 1900, I served two terms as city clerk of McLeansboro. I was also active in Democrat politics, as is evidenced by my being in this picture with William Jennings Bryan when he came here campaigning for president in 1902. This is William Jennings Bryan, and this distinguished looking gentleman here looking at the camera is yours truly. The car is a 1902 Groat steam car. It was uh, at a steam engine. I was also a director of the Cloud State Bank, and we had a very active family life. Yes, we did. We had six children, including a set of twin boys. Unfortunately, we were able to raise only four. Our daughter, Lucille, died the day after she was born. Then we had Nellie, Ruth, Bill, and the twins, John and Paul. Paul died when he was just six, weeks, six years old. Paul died when he was just six years old. He suffered for about six weeks and couldn't recover. 
and I was so distraught that I couldn't attend the funeral, which was held here at the cemetery. There was an article on the front page of the paper on his passing, and it said that he was liked by all who knew his pleasant face, and that he will be missed more than we can say, which was so very true. Of course, I had the other four children, and I had J.C., and I had my church. I had been a very active member of the Presbyterian Church uh, from very early childhood. After J.C. and I married, we decided that I would be baptized and join the First Baptist Church, where he was so active. I taught a class of young ladies for Sunday school. I had taught in the public school before we married. In 1908, we opened the Carter Millinery Shop. This is an advertisement that we put in the paper that says that we have our fall and winter merchandise in and that we're going to sell at fair prices. Mrs. Fanny Denbo is operating the store. The store opened just a few weeks before our young Paul died, and I operated the shop after that. It was located in J.C.'s Monument Works building. We were blessed with four grandchildren, although two were born after I died. This is a picture of me when I was 54 years old with our Nellie's only son, Eddie Rod. Eddie was killed in a tragic accident at the McLeansboro Fire Station when he was only 33 years old. That was in 1950. His daughter, Jean Rice Rule, presently lives in McLeansboro, and her great her grandson, that's our great 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 grandson, Corey Skelton, is presently a part-time policeman with the city of McLeansboro. Well, I wasn't healthy the last years of my life. I suffered with tu tuberculosis for about five years. And then in 1923, I died at home at the age of 59. I was buried here with our children, Lucille and Paul. J.C. designed and carved these beautiful granite monuments for our family. I'd like to read a little bit from Bina's obituary. Her life has been an open book. She was firm in her convictions, a true friend. She was always pleasant, and during her protracted illness, she showed fortitude that astonished one and all. Bina was a womanly woman, a loyal wife, an affectionate and devoted mother, and a Christian lady. We were married 41 years. But life goes on. I lived another 18 years after buying a fast and never remarried. In addition to the monument business, I was also engaged in general stone work. And examples of that work can be seen today in the Methodist Church here in McLeansboro, the Presbyterian Church in Shawneetown, and the old high school in Harrisburg. I got my marble from Vermont, my granite from Georgia, and the limestone from the famous Green River quarries of Kentucky. I was always interested in local history, and as time went on, I found that more and more people sought me out for my knowledge of the olden times in the Plainsboro and Hamilton County. I was an avid gardener and took great pride in many flowers that I grew. Uh, weather was always an interest of mine, and for many years I maintained a weather station in the garden and conscientiously recorded the temperature and rainfall and other weather information. One day as I was going about my daily business in early September of 1941, I died suddenly of heart failure. I was 84 years old. I had a good life. I would like to read to you a, just a short passage from uh, J.C.'s obituary so that you'll know what a fine man he really was. J.C. loved nature and humanity, and he considered all men to be equal. Both his body and mind were exceptionally healthy, and he was genial, humorous, and had simple tastes and habits. He was courageous, proud, self-reliant, 
and he had the faith that comes with close kinship with God. One of his favorite passages ended, Approach thy grave like one who wraps the drapery of his couch about him and lies down to pleasant dreams. Thank you very much. Benson's wife, and I came here today to help to memorialize me, and when I heard it was going to be me, I had to don something fancy, so here I am. This perhaps is a pretty bad time for me because I'm still in mourning for my son, who was killed in a car accident about a year ago. He was uh, going home, and just a few miles from home at the Big Four Railroad crossing. He hit a train car head on, but was not killed instantly. He was able to get out of the car and stumble to a neighbor's house. And with the, he had, we assumed he was okay, but he only lived one day because he had massive internal injuries. And I'm still living with that on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, my life is not about death at this time. My life is about wanting the people of McLeansboro to know something about me. I was more than just a mother. Whenever I was uh, born in Iowa, I lived there for a few years, and then my family moved to northern Illinois, a town in uh, Livingston County. And I had a wonderful family. Uh, I was very close to my uh, brothers and sisters, and I remain close to them to this day. And uh, the uh, memories that come to me at times will be quite touching. I'll try not to burden you with all of them. But let's go with the happy memories. I, I met um, my husband, Dr. John George Benson, when he was going to medical school in St. Louis. And uh, I was also going to a school up there. My father had sent me to. Uh, and we fell in love instantly. And I was going to, I thought we would be married at my parents' home in northern Illinois, but he wanted to be married in his hometown of McLeansboro. So that's what we did. But my father didn't want to just go to his house, to his new son-in-law's house, to, I mean, new son-in-law to be. He wanted to have our house. So my father bought a house in McLeansboro for the wedding to be held. My brother decided to get married the week before I did, and then he joined us at the house for our wedding. Uh, it was fabulous, it was beautiful, and we, I, we had made good friends in McLeansboro, so I felt at home there. And we immediately went into a grand social life. My husband was uh, the son of Dr. Valentine Benson, one of the noted doctors in McLeansboro. His uncle was uh, General James Campbell. I'm sorry, not his uncle. His sister's husband was General James Campbell. So we had a great introduction to the city. We bought a big house near uh, on, on Randolph Street, near where the railroad tracks are now. And uh, but after we'd lived there about 10 years, we decided that we wanted a bigger house, so we bought a huge house on South Jackson, which would be located real close to where the post office is now, across the street. And we were very happy there, and then around 1900, my husband started becoming disoriented and was not feeling well all the time. He had, uh, by this time, started a drug store up on the square, on the north side of the square, that he and his dad owned. So he... Uh, really couldn't handle that business very well. He took in a partner, and he still wasn't feeling good. And then in 1905, he uh, became much more ill. His, uh, he was missing a lot of the days at work, that type of thing. And he went to St. Louis. They took him into the hospital, and he was dead in three weeks. His, he finally died of a heart uh, attack. Now, that was my first real dealing 
with tragedy. And I, like many widows do, I went into a seclusion. And luckily, I, we did have close friends here in McLeansboro. So I was had them to lean on. And I did that and got my strength again. That was 1905 that my husband died. And I, it took a couple of years, but I came out of it and I became very active with the local ladies. Uh, we formed several organizations, uh, women's clubs and that type of thing. We tried to do beneficial things for the community. My son at that time, when my husband died, was 19 and he was uh, going to get educated. So with him out of the house too, I was very lost. And it did me well to keep busy and join these clubs. In about 1915, we had been trying to get the local library started and we got some books together and we're really working on helping the children and the uh, people of the community to read some good books. Uh, then someone who was aware of what we needed, uh, once we had the city had inherited been willed the McCoy Library, they were looking for someone to run it, and they chose me. And uh, that was wonderful. Of course, Mrs. Pate helped a lot. There, I could name many, many people who were there for me, and we got together a wonderful amount of books, and we had the authority to order new books from uh, many different places. So we started this wonderful library, and I worked there on a daily basis, making $18 a week. And that was for all week. Uh, and I, but I loved it. I loved the children. I loved all the people. And uh, my uh, my son had gotten married, and of course he married well. And I think that was partly due to the fact that General Campbell, his sister's husband, was the owner of the local flour mill, was a director in uh, the bank, also uh, owned the lumber company. And he had made my son a director and an officer in every company he was involved in. So my son was pretty well guaranteed to have a good job. He uh, ended up in uh, 1915 marrying Faye Pomeroy, who was the wife of uh, Frank Pomeroy, who owned the Carmi Bank. Uh, he moved into a lovely little home. They called it a cottage in Carmi with his bride. And in 1917, they were parents of a daughter. Uh, Caroline was her name. And uh, she also was a very high society lady over there. Uh, she was quite prim and proper, though. Uh, she had, uh, was, this time, um, about 25 or 26. So instead of her having a nice, white, beautiful flowing gown, for her marriage, she had a blue chiffon traveling suit with a matching hat. Her uh, wedding was in the afternoon, and four hours after her wedding, her and her new husband got on the train for Florida and took a month to uh, travel through Florida and Cuba, had a wonderful honeymoon, and he came back to, of course, have his busy life at the, as he at that time was superintendent of the flour mill. He was, had a very nervous temperament, and leading up to his car crash, was it, which was in 1929, the, uh, he had been involved that previous year in several accidents that were very close to being fatal for other people. That was mentioned in his obituary. So when he did have this horrific accident, I died, part of me died too, and, and I, I felt like life had ended. But I went on, I stayed at the library, I worked hard. My uh, granddaughter Caroline came to visit now and then, and my son, Ralph, Richard Ralph Benson, visited when he could. He lived in Carmi, though. But finally, I, I became quite ill, and in 1937, I had to retire from the library. And I died in 1938 at the age of 76. Um, it feels very strange coming and looking at your gravesite, at your son, your husband, and knowing.
knowing that the mark you made on the community was so valuable, but also knowing it was sad that the community never seemed to really appreciate it. I was for 15 years the librarian of this community, and you don't see any monuments. There's no, I, there was, my picture was never the paper. I just kind of wish somebody would really appreciate me now because I did this community a lot of good. So thank you all for coming. That in itself is a good tribute. Thank you. I'm Molly Lynn Utley, daughter of Thomas and Martha Jane Utley. I was born in January of 1862 in Hamilton County, and I met my husband, Noble Utley, son of David and Clarissa Utley, when he came to Hamilton County from Posey County, Indiana, with his widowed mother in 1880. We married in 1883 and had six children. One died in infancy. One lived to be 23, and his name was Royal. And Clarence lived to be 45. We had Eula, Eugene, and Ralph, who lived to be older adults. We had three grandchildren, Edith Maud, Paul Utley, and Jean Utley. A group of citizens, including our family, wanted to build a church in McLeansboro. We wanted to build a Christian church. It was organized in February of 1876, and the person who came to organize this was Elder James Baker of Carbondale. We had 17 members. The meetings for quite some time was held in the courthouse basement because we had no uh, building at that point to uh, meet. A contract was left to a man by the name of George Hoffman for $1,365. He had a fine riding horse which he sold and applied the money that he received to go on our church bring the price down. And we had several members who donated a lot of labor and time in erecting our church. The building was completed in 1881 at a cost of $1,800. A tower was built on the building and it told every meeting that we had and it could be heard all over town. We were the first couple, my husband, Noble, and I, to be married in the church. And we were the first person to be baptized in the church. Mr. Utley organized a choir and remained its director for 45 years. In 1880, Mr. Cloud gave us a lovely communion set. After a period of time, we weren't using it, and we decided that we should let someone, for safekeeping, take it to their home, which they did. The church was very fortunate that this lady took such good care of it, because we lost our church in a fire in 1922. The communion said, after uh, we got organized again in the new building, brought the communion set back in 1956, where it remains today. As our church was burning, a group of young men came to watch the fire, and they did rescue our original organ, which has since been refinished, and it remains in the church to this day. We decided after our church was built, we were so enthralled with it that we would have a beautiful all-day dedication service. And we notified people in surrounding towns, and we had a large crowd that day who attended. We had a bountiful dinner served, 
and at the close of the evening service, a group of hooded Ku Klux Klansmen marched into the church, and they brought a check for $100 and the note that they presented to the minister said this, O oh, might men do the things they teach. O oh, might men live the lives that they preach. And to this day, that would be a good slogan for the world to live by, wouldn't it? Eula Utley, our daughter, served as the organist for more than 50 years at the church. She often said that at times she had served and played for five generations of people. She very, very rarely ever missed a service. One time the church, to show their appreciation, gave her a wonderful silver tray, which she cherished. She never used it, but kept it in her parlor where all could see it. In 1925, there was a terrific tornado hit McLeansboro more south than in town, and it would travel for many, many miles. We had a group of ladies in our church called the Willing Workers, and they sat up day and night sewing and providing needs for the people who had lost their belongings and badly injured or had passed away from accidents. I have seen several events in my life. One of them was I saw the first train coming through McLeansboro. My, what an event that was. We had a large crowd down there to see that come through. And it was such a such a thing that the children, some of them were scared about it, and they just clung to their parents as it roared into town with all that steam. And then I also attended the first burial that was held in this cemetery. I passed away at pneumonia. In 1946, I lived only six years after losing my husband. I passed away of pneumonia and a heart disease. Thank you all for coming, and we would welcome you to come and attend our historical meetings any time that they are held. We're always welcoming new members. Thank you, and have a wonderful weekend. In 1840, the three Cummins boys loaded up their families, all that they had on flat boats, and they floated down the Ohio River to a place where Bay Creek flows into the Ohio River on the Illinois side. And there they uh, made landfall and they settled in Johnson County in a place uh, called Reedsville. Now, if you live south of the Ohio River, you would pronounce that reads book. But if you live on the Illinois side, which is where they landed, you would call that Reedsville. Now the oldest of those three boys was named Peter, and he was my granddaddy. And he had a boy named uh, uh, Daniel. He was my daddy. Daniel married a, a lady called Elizabeth Smith, and she was my mama. And to that union was born ten children. Now right after the Civil War, 1866 I was born and I was number seven in the family and daddy wasn't much of a of a religious man he kind of left all that religious teaching up to mama mama was a strong Methodist and she raised us kids to be strong Methodists also she did such a good job that uh, five of the five of the boys became menace, uh, Methodist ministers which is what I am to this to this day and and uh, she uh, uh, took good care of us my, I remember my first uh, uh, experience as a, as a preacher was at a little five-point circuit down in Hickory Grove, Kentucky. Now, most people talk about preachers as being uh, circuit riders. Well, I was poor. I didn't have anything to ride, and so 
I had to walk to all five of my churches. Uh, I guess you'd call me a, a circuit walker. But my uh, later on, my uh, uh, my uh, formal education began at McKendry College, and I graduated from there. Later, I went on to study at the Garrett Theological Seminary and Drew University. Actually, I came back a few years later and was uh, dean of the summer ministry school uh, at McKendry. I did that for 20 years. I'm getting ahead of myself, though. Uh, just before I graduated, I met this girl. Uh, she had Mayfield, Kentucky girl, and oh, I tell you, there wasn't a more lovely creature walked the surface of this earth. Her name was Katie Landrum Key. And I got to tell you, I was so smitten with her. I was smitten with her. I courted her. I courted her hard. And I courted her long. And uh, uh, finally she said that she would marry me. And so right after my graduation from McKendry, we got married. And that was in 1892. And we came here to McLeansboro. And I took the first Methodist church here and pastored that church. And we started our lives together. We started our family together. Two boys, my two oldest boys, Wendell and Wallace, were born here. Uh, and we continued to serve the Lord until I remember, say, I think it was, 18, yeah, it was 1897. In 1897, I came down with a bad case of typhoid fever. And I got to tell you, if it hadn't have been for the, the healing of the Lord and the uh, the, the nursing of my beloved Katie, I don't think I would I would be here today. But you know, the Lord, uh, He helped me out, and, and Katie nursed me, and I uh, recovered. And not all clouds have a have a, a dark lining, because I also remember it was in that same year that our first little baby girl was born. We called her Little Marie, and I, I got to tell you. Now, boys are fine. I love them boys dearly. But I remember that little girl when I'd hold her in my arms and I'd rock her and she'd look up at me with those eyes and smile. I tell you what, next to her mama, I just don't think there was a more lovely creature on this earth anywhere. And she was such a fine child and I loved her so dearly and so did her mama. And uh, about two, two years, 1899, I guess it was, it, we were going to move to, to Olney to serve a church up there. And just before we were to move to Olney, a little Marie died. And she's laying right right over there. Now, i got to tell you, I took it hard. Oh, I took it hard. Didn't know what to do. But Katie, again, brought me through it. And life goes on. And... and uh, we moved to Alney, served the church in Alney there, and before a, a year was out, the Lord had sent us another little baby girl, and we called her little Katie L., Katie Louise. Again, she was the apple of her daddy's eye, but also the apple of her mama's eye and, and the apple of her brother's eye, and we all continued to serve the Lord there in Alney and, and grew in the Lord, and, and then in 1900, we had another son. We named him John Wesley Kay. Uh, and we all continued as a family to, to serve the Lord. And oh, the Lord blessed us in, in so many ways. 1905, we were moved to uh, down the road about 25 miles to the uh, Mount Carmel Church. And uh, we served uh, served there and, uh, and, uh, for, for two years. Uh, little Katie and, and, and the boys, it was such a, such a wonderful time. And then in 1907, uh, we were called back here to McLeansboro to a brand new church that was being built. At that time, it was called the Methodist Episcopal Church, the ME Church. And uh, I was to come back and serve as a pastor there. But just before we left, just it was almost just deja vu again because just before we left to return to this church, our little Katie died. Her mama took that awful hard. We brought her back down here, and she's laying right there next to her sister. But time goes on, and life goes on. We moved back down here to McLeansboro, and I became the pastor here. And I presided at the laying of the cornerstone of the First Methodist Episcopal Church. And as you go into that church today, 
as you walk up to the main entrance and you look off to your left just before you go in the big double doors, you'll see that stone, that cornerstone that was laid there uh, when I was pastor. Well, sir, life went on, years passed. I pastored several churches in Illinois and a few in uh, Missouri. And then in 1941, I retired from the ministry. And uh, Katie and I was really looking forward to a life of uh, uh, being together. The, the, the kids were raised. They were gone, and, and I had retired. They would called me at the time of my retirement the silver-tongued orator of the of the Midwest, and I was, even though retired, I was much in demand for speaking engagements. Uh, but mainly, Katie and I were looking forward just to our golden years together, uh, living in, in retirement. But the Lord had other ideas, and in 1942, my beloved Katie passed away. And I gotta tell you, when she died, a lot of me died with her. I wandered aimlessly for about a year. Then one, about a year, I guess about a year later, I uh, was at a retreat in uh, Lake Junaleska, Methodist retreat, and I met this lady there. Her name was Ida Skelton Ramsey. She was alone. I was alone. And in 1943, we married and spent 12 wonderful years together. We were in Florida on her 81st birthday, January 21st, and she passed away. And we buried her beside her first husband in Birmingham, Alabama. And from there, I went to live with Wendell. And for the next eight years, for seven of those eight years, I taught a Sunday school class in Dallas, Texas. And then on September 1st, 1967, I get this birthday card from, of all people, the President of the United States, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And he congratulated me on, on being a, a hundred years old. And the TV stations in Dallas, they sent out their cameras and they sent out their crews and they interviewed me and I sung old church hymns for wonderful day. It was a wonderful day. I just wish my Katie could have been there. And then six months later, the Lord called me to his church eternal. And they had my funeral right up here, in what is now the First United Methodist Church in McLeansboro. And they laid me to rest right here, this spot, right beside my beloved Katie. And here we'll be. Until that wonderful, glorious day when the Lord calls us to be with Him. And every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And now will you bow with me for a benediction? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you for coming this afternoon. Ritz and Daniel here. I'm from Tennessee. Born in Tennessee in 1845. My folks, I was about this boy's age, Woody here. We'll talk with Woody a little later. Uh, but uh, we moved from Tennessee down around, uh, we was from uh, real close to Fort Donaldson, uh, Tennessee. And my folks moved up here and we moved to Wayne County. But we're just barely in Wayne County. Is up here by Dalgram and Obdike in between there, and I was, I was about this boy Woody's size, I was 12, and uh, we lived up there, and the Civil War broke out in 1861 there, and uh, I was 16, but I thought I better join up, and uh, so I did, joined up in the Civil War and headed down to Anna Jonesboro, and they taught me how to soldier a little bit down there, and they sent me on then to Tennessee. I was down there in the siege of Corinth, Mississippi, then went on to Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge. Woody, he, he kind of likes to dress up in my old Civil War uniform, don't you, Woody? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, and uh, 
spent time in Atlanta. I signed up for three years, and at the end of three years, I rejoined up again. And they sent me home for on leave, and while I was home on leave, there I met a woman named uh, Frances Boswell and married her while I was home on leave. Well, it's time for me to go back to the war, and I went back to the war, and while I was gone, they had elected me sergeant. And uh, that wasn't the best thing uh, that happened to me. Uh, it was a sad time for me. My, uh, my wife, I married, died while I was gone off to the war. And uh, so I finished out the war down down there in Georgia with Sherman's army and ended up in Bentonville, North Carolina. We come back from the war, it was over. I was only 20 years old then. But I met another woman then up in Wayne County. Her name was uh, Woody. What was her name? Uh, Sullinger woman. Uh, what was her first name? Elizabeth Sullinger. That's who it was. We married, and and uh, we decided we were going to move to McLeansboro. We moved to McLeansboro, and while we lived here, we had four children. And, uh, well, she got sick. We was married about eight years, and she got sick and died. That was in 1874. And uh, I had uh, I had kids to raise, so uh, I found me another woman. Uh, uh, Mary Goodwin was her name. You remember her, Woody? I used to call her mama. Yeah, you did. You called her mama. This is Woody's grave here. What, what's the deal there, Woody? Well, I was born in 1839 and got sickness in 1910 and died. Yeah, he always called me Grandpa and called, uh, called my wife Mary, called her mother. He, your daddy got killed in an accident. In the mill. In, down in the mill. Your mama had died a little earlier, so we didn't have nobody to take you. come to stay with me, didn't you? Uh, yeah. About a year. Yeah, about a year. Well, me and, me and Mary, we was married for 58 years. We had three children. I spent my time here in McLeanboro in public service. I had been the deputy deputy county clerk and the city clerk. Uh, I had been an alderman, justice of the peace, township supervisor, board of education, police magistrate and before it was over I, I spent about 60 years in public service here and uh, Woody here Woody did you tell him you just got the sickness right and we lived down on we lived down on Washington Street where we lived and is down by where the ghost and funeral home is now. And that's where Woody is living with us when, when he died. But anyway, I, uh, I had a, a long career. And uh, I never, I was six, 96 years old when I died. And I was the last Civil War vet from McLeansboro. I'd written a book, an autobiography, when I was 85 years old. I was a member of the Grand Army of the Republic here, and and uh, like I said, and, and you knew him too, old A. Blaster. We lived right across the street from one another. We'd all the time go to uh, the Grand Army of the Republic meetings. Well, that's about my story. I'm going to have you move along to see the bigger staffs. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for stopping by. My name is Thomas West from Biggerstaff. My friends all call me Wes. I was born in April of 1860 over by Thackeray, which 
It's a community over here in, Pro in Crook Township. And I uh, was raised on the farm there, the family farm. I uh, went to school in a one-room school. I started school when I was seven years old. And uh, there were students there from my age up to 16 or 17. Back in those days, we only went to school five months out of the year, so we could work at home the rest of the year. The children were kept busy uh, collecting eggs and feeding the chickens and what chores took a lot of legwork off of our parents. As uh, I got older, my father saw that I had a, a, a penchant for education, for learning, and so he allowed me to go to the Southern Illinois Academy, which was in Enfield. After graduating from the Academy, I took my uh, teaching certificate test and passed and became a teacher. I went to, to work in the Hamilton County School District teaching in a one-room school. Back in those days, this was 1880, uh, teaching in a one-room school was not for the faint-hearted. I didn't pay much. I only made about $15 a month. With the fact that I had to teach the students, which run all the way from 7 to 16 or 17, and the oldest may not have ever reached the 8th grade yet, uh, I had to be the janitor. I had to fire the stove, draw the water, and, uh, and then teach the students, which uh, became quite a job. The janitor job was quite, uh, quite a job because there were only dirt roads then, and there was a lot of muddy tracks in the schoolhouse at the end of the day. Uh, in 1883, I moved here to McLeansboro and took a job with, in the city of McLeansboro teaching school here. And here I only taught one grade. It was seventh grade normally uh, at the grade school. Uh, by, uh, by that period, by that time, I was uh, pretty well established in the community and had uh, moved my membership from my old church at Hopewell here to the First Baptist in McLeansboro, and I became the superintendent of the Sunday school. Back then, we would have over 300 people at Sunday school on Sunday morning. It was quite an undertaking. I, uh, I enjoyed that. I became a deacon in the church and uh, served in the church all my life. I uh, was hired as a principal of the new high school in 1887, which I very, very much enjoyed. About that period of time, I felt that uh, I needed someone to share my life with me, so I began to cast my eye about at the opposite sex to see if I could find a likely lady who would become my wife. And I did. Uh, this young lady, she was 10 years my junior, but she had a sparkling eye and a good heart. Her name was Nora O'Neill. I asked her father for her hand, and we were wed in 1889. We had a wonderful life together. We had six children together. In 1902, I was elected as superintendent of schools and served two terms. In 1903, I uh, joined the Masonic Lodge here and enjoyed their work and remained a Mason the rest of my life. Uh, in uh, 1923, I lost my wife, Nora. And a year later, I suffered a stroke, which left me severely crippled. And my health deteriorated from that point. And I passed away in 1927 at the age of 66 years and 11 months. Thank you very much for stopping by. My name is Nora Josephine Biggerstaff. I was born in March 22nd in 1870. And I know that's a mouthful, but my family name is O'Neill. And here is my father. My papa was Samuel Marshall O'Neill. And my mama was Sally Crouch O'Neill. 
Now, the Crouch family are well, were well established in McLeansboro because my great grandfather came here and settled in 18 and 16 when it was just a frontier city. My mama passed away whenever I was quite young. I was only about six years old. But Papa married again a fine lady by the name of Felina Ingram. And she was such a loving stepmother to me and cared for me during my growing up years. I wasn't the only thing growing during that time. McLeansboro was growing too. We were really excited whenever we found out that they were going to build a new school building. They were going to build the East Side High School. In 1877, it was a two-story brick building. Everyone was so excited. I heard Papa say that it cost $9,000. Can you imagine? That was quite a change from the old log buildings that they had, or even the frame building that was built by C.H. Hurd. Uh, there was other things that was going on in McLeansboro at that time. I was just a young teenager whenever we found out that they were going to put 12 beautiful oil-burning lamps around the square. Can you imagine how excited we were? You could go uptown at night now, and it was just like it was daytime. Well, of course, I didn't get to go because my papa was too strict, and I was just a young teenager, and so he wouldn't allow me to go. It was a few years later whenever I found out that there was a very handsome young gentleman by the name of Thomas Wesley Biggerstaff, and he was showing a lot of attention my way, and I can't say that I was exactly rejecting that attention either. When he asked Papa for my hand in marriage, I thought I would faint. Well, we started our family, our married life together uh, right here in McLeansboro. And by that time, in 1910, I believe it was, or 1900, there was an article written by a gentleman that said McLeansboro was a very prominent city, one of the best in the United States. Can you imagine? And you know why they said that? They said that because we had our own electric plant that was taking electricity and sending it right into our homes and businesses. Also, it, it powered our water system. Oh, we went from oil lamps to water in the home and electricity in our homes. It was so exciting. There was other things that was going on at the time also. Um, our family, we decided that we would start our family. As Thomas mentioned earlier, we had six children. Our first child was Royal O'Neill, who was born in 18 and 90. And uh, we were so thrilled to have a son. Our second child was also a son, and he was born two years later. And we named him Thomas Marshall. Our third child was named Edith Jewel Biggerstaff. We were so thrilled to have a little girl, and she was truly a jewel. The next child was John William Biggerstaff, but everyone just called him Bill, and he was born in 1899. Our next child was born in 1904, and his name was Robert Wesley. He was named after his daddy. The last child that we had uh, was Lena Lenora Biggerstaff, and we were so thrilled to have another little girl. Two of our children married. Uh, John, or Bill, as everyone called him, married a fine young lady by the name of Virginia Kitchen, and they had two boys. And Lena Lenora married uh, a, a gentleman by the name of John Lockwood, and they had one daughter. So you can see I had a very, very rewarding life. Uh, I watched a pioneer town go to a, a thriving city uh, from, electric from oil lamps to electricity and from carrying water from a well to a pump or to a faucet. And that's very exciting. You know, I even saw the first mail, air mail delivery in McLeansboro. 
uh, everyone stood around the square and watched as the plane flew over the courthouse and it got lower and lower and finally dropped the mail pouch. Oh, that was so exciting. Well, in uh, 1922, about 1922, I became very ill and after a lingering illness, I passed away, went to be with the Lord, and four years later, Thomas joined me. All of our children, with the exception of Robert, who moved to uh, Detroit, Michigan, are buried right here, close to Mama and Daddy. I hope that you've enjoyed your visit through history today, and won't you come back and see us again? here today with Mrs. Shirley Wolf. She's the great, great niece of the Reverend John Wesley Cummins, who is part of our cemetery walk. Uh, Ma'am, would you care to share some of your memories of your, your uncle with us? Yes. I have, I have memories of him. Uh, well, maybe because he lived to be 100. 100 and a half. So therefore, even in my lifetime, you know, I, I saw him many times. Uh, I was never, of course, uh, living in the same town where he was, but uh, I got to see him. Uh, as I said, he was my great, great uncle. And uh, oddly enough, on my mother's side, it's kind of strange because our family was kind of intermarried, as they did back in those days of all being in the same community. And uh, well, my father's name was Cummins. She was also a Methodist preacher. Uh, I'm the kid who's on Wesley Cummins on my mother's side. It's probably a little strange, but it's what it is. Um, I attended John Wesley Cummins' funeral in the Methodist Church when he died in 1967. And I remember that very of course. Okay. It, and uh, isn't it amazing that a, a person like that can be so well known and, and, and receive a birthday card from the president and make such a profound impact on the community he served? I'm sure you're very proud of him. Uh, we, we are. And uh, he did have an impact on the community. He was, he was known far and wide for his skill in the pulpit. Uh, he was just very good as a, as a preacher. And uh, uh, I I've heard, uh, I've heard many people say about what a, what a fine job he did as a preacher, and uh, I knew him better than any of the uh, his other pastor brothers. He had uh, four brothers who also became his pastor, and, uh, uh, but he was the one that we were around the most, and for some reason, I don't know why, but anyway, my, my bedroom was just a uh, uh, business This church was very important to her in the little community in which they grew up. It was, a, of course, just a country community. There was a little country church there that was very important in his life and uh, in their lives. And uh, uh, anyway, he, uh, it was, he was just quite a guy and had a, had a, a large impact on the Southern Illinois Methodist, on the Methodist Conference in Southern Illinois. He was, um, he was a president of the board of McKinley College for many years, and uh, uh, in the uh, within the conference, I know that he was a, uh, a sort of teacher of the preachers. I mean, he was uh, in, uh, invaluable in the conference, in their training school for pastors. And I so enjoyed the man's portrayal of him. He did such a great job. It didn't look like him, of course, but he, he sure did uh, uh, talk like him. <laughs> and that was crazy. And, uh, he didn't use an old or anything. He just stood up there and acted like he was John Wesley Cummins. <laughs> that was crazy. My husband and our two daughters came quite a distance today just to hear this. And I think your cemetery walk is perfectly fantastic. 
Um, I'm going to go back and um, preach to my own historical society and say, listen, we've got to get with it. <laughs> we've got to, we've had cemeteries and, you know, and interesting people in those cemeteries and for many, many years. Uh, our county is actually one of the oldest in the county, next to St. Clair and I think Randolph. Uh, our only the ones that are as old as our county is. So we got to get with it on this thing. I bet you, was it, was it kind of surprising to hear, though, that people talk about your ancestor and they were going to do this as part of the cemetery walk, and it, it, and it went so well, and I'm glad you really enjoyed it. Yes, and Mary and Pat Russell came down to our house and, uh, and introduced themselves to us and invited us to come to this, and I appreciate that very much. Well, thank you, Mrs. Wolf, for coming. We sure appreciate this interview with you. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the cemetery walk. A lot of people worked very hard to make it a success. Let's meet some of them. My name is Robert Eugene Barker, better known as Bob to my friends and neighbors. I was born here in Hamilton County in Neal, Illinois in 1941, four days before Pearl Harbor. Uh, my father was Arlie. Barker, my mother was Golda, Lucille, Webb, Barker, and my grandfather's name was Elijah Webb, and my paternal grandfather was James Thomas Barker, all from Hamilton County. I uh, graduated from El Dorado Township High School in 1959, and uh, shortly after that, uh, married my childhood sweetheart, uh, Geraldine Owen Barker. We've been married 51 years and have two children, uh, Vi and Robin. I have two grandchildren and one great-grandchild. Uh, I am portraying Thomas Wesley Biggerstaff, who was an educator in Hamilton County. He started out as a teacher, uh, became principal of the high school, and was superintendent of schools uh, in the early 19, 1900s. He was a noted individual. He was also a member of the Masonic Lodge, as I am. And uh, I would be, if I had lived at his time, I would have been proud to call him brother. I really enjoy being a member of the Historical Society. I have uh, served in some positions and just enjoy being a member, period. Uh, we uh, do a lot of uh, things for the for the county, and uh, I'm sure they're appreciative of the things that the Historical Society does. I feel that uh, every county should have some form of a historical society to perpetuate the life that came before us and to thank the, our predecessors for all the things that they've done for us. I uh, would uh, appreciate you all coming to the cemetery walk. Thank you for coming. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And uh, hope you come back next year. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Jan Leake, and I had the privilege of portraying Nora Josephine Biggerstaff. My husband and I are not originally from Hamilton County, but we've lived here for many years. Uh, my husband uh, is a retired Baptist minister, and he is teaching at this time. Our children are Je Sherry, Jerry, and Jeffrey. Sherry lives in West Frankfurt. Jerry lives here in McLeansboro, and Jeffrey lives up near Springfield, Illinois. I have had such a good time of researching Nora Biggerstaff, her life, her family, the events of her life, and I hope that you have been able to glean something of interest also. If you have an interest in the history of Hamilton County, please contact the Historical Society and they'll be glad to help you. And I, again, I want to say thank you for coming this evening. Hi, I'm Donna Brayton Broyles Mariner. Uh, Many of you may remember me from last year when I also did the cemetery walk. 
and portrayed Elsie Lockwood, who uh, was a pioneer here in McLeansboro, the wife of Jesse Lockwood. Uh, that was really a fun project. My mom, Nadine Broyles, who uh, is also a member, or was also a member of the Historical Society, helped me tremendously in doing research for Elsie Lockwood. And she was just starting to help me uh, do the research on Fanny Benson, who I portrayed this time. And uh, unfortunately, she got cancer and died February the 6th, 2011. So much of my work now will be in her memory. And uh, if you haven't met me before, I came from Florida a couple of years ago just to be with mom and uh, help her in her last years. And I was very confident that she would live at least 10 years because her uh, mother, Lena Flanagan Braden, lived to be 100, so why wouldn't my mom? But that doesn't always happen the way we want it to. So uh, I've left Florida behind after living there for 25 years to a wonderful British uh, guy who was witty, intelligent, handsome, was very fortunate, uh, and came to McLeansboro where many of my relatives, my current relatives live. I've got cousins and aunts here who are also a tremendous help. And um, the blessings of living in a community where you have close family is really kind of foreign to me because for 25 years I lived in Florida where only my next door neighbors and about 30 friends, mostly British, were my family. So now here I am in McLeansboro, a widow, and also now an orphan. Uh, my sister lives in Arkansas, and it's been uh, difficult getting used to losing a mother. I'm sure that many, many, many of you have done so, but uh, you know how hard it is. So this cemetery walk was dedicated to my mom, Nadine Broyles, uh, a member of, in addition to the Hamilton County Society, Historical Society. She was a member of the Franklin County Historical Society and very active as such and quite active in politics and had very opinionated in her religion or lack of it. Uh, a fun person to talk to, well read and well educated by her own readings and her own schooling. She took several courses uh, in college uh, when they lived in Alton. So uh, thanks for participating in the cemetery walk and for getting to know me and also for getting to uh, know my mother as many of you did. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marie Sadler. I'm portraying the life of Molly Lynn Utley. My mother's was Myrtle Turrentine. She was a Sandusky before she married, daughter of Franklin Sandusky and wife Ella Ward. They came from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania into Hamilton County and they raised a family of nine. My grandfather had a grocery store west of town where the uh, Clarence Peppel family now owns, and he helped many people during the Depression years uh, through the store. He gave many groceries away. My father was Martin Turntine, and he and his family came from Chapel Hill, North Carolina in the 1700s. They settled in Hamilton County. And his mother was Miranda Sykes. They had a family of nine children. I later married, whenever I was grown, Cleo Sadler from Durmright, Oklahoma. We lived our life in Hamilton County off and on because we were in pipeline construction and was gone quite a bit. 
but uh, I love Hamilton County. It certainly is home to me. And we had three sons. Roger and his wife now live in Little Rock, Arkansas. They had three children, all boys. Our second son, Larry, and his wife live in Denver, Colorado. They have a daughter and a son. Our third son, David, and his wife live in Duquoin, Illinois, and they have a daughter and a son. I have certainly enjoyed the organizations that I belong to, and we would like to invite all of you to come as our guests to any of our historical meetings, and if you enjoy history, we would invite you to join us as members. Thank you so much. Eugene Penny Van Winkle, and uh, I've been a member of our local historical society now since the 1980s and uh, have enjoyed uh, being a member of our society. And uh, as a student, as a, and even a young uh, uh, student in grade school, I always, always enjoyed history and, uh, uh, and, and it's continued with me my entire life. Uh, our family, the Van Winkles and the Munsells, we had, uh, were some of the earliest people in this county and uh, uh, a descendant of a Revolutionary War soldier, a uh, little Paige Proctor. But uh, th this year's cemetery walk, I will be uh, and have been uh, uh, studying uh, a Woodson Daniel and uh, portrayed him and uh, as we prepare for this uh, uh, cemetery walk and our presentation, we learn more uh, about uh, prominent citizens of our, uh, of our county and it is the case. And we hope we was able to uh, present that to you and uh, so you would be even more uh, informed of uh, prominent uh, people in our county. But in, again, as I said, in, in presenting this and uh, preparing for it, we, uh, we learn more even than uh, we're able to uh, uh, present during our cemetery walk. So I uh, hope you enjoyed the presentation, and uh, we thank you for coming, and we look forward to, uh, uh, this was our second year, and we look forward to next year and uh, the years after. So thank you for coming. Hello, my name is Lucas Stover. I'm 14 years old. I go to uh, Unit 10 Junior High School off the highway. And uh, the character I'll be portraying in the Hamilton County Historical Society Cemetery Walk will be Woodson Daniel Jr. He was the grandson of Woodson Daniel Sr., which will be portrayed as Penny Van Winkle. And uh, Woodson Daniel Jr. was only 12 years old when he died in 1910. In his obituary, it did it not say what he died of, but most of the time back then, a lot of kids and babies and children died at a young age of disease. And uh, this was really fun doing this and I hope to do this next year and uh, I invite a lot of more younger people to do this. I, right now I'm the youngest member of the Historical Society so I invite more people to do this. It's pretty fun and we need some more people. So thank you. My name is Doris Nelson and I portrayed Elnora Blades Ledbetter in the cemetery walk this year. I really enjoyed getting to know my character because I really admired her spirit. Even though she lost her husband very early on in their marriage and she had to raise her three boys by herself and she also lost one of her sons at a fairly young age, she was still able to sing praises in the church choir. 
She was an amazing lady, and it was an honor for me to get to represent her this year. I was born and raised in Hamilton County. I was the youngest daughter of uh, Arthur and Ruby Cottingham. I have two brothers and one sister, Claire's, Carl, and Dana. And my roots in this county go way back because uh, both of my families, both of my parents' families moved here in the middle 1800s. When my great-great-grandfather Ephraim Jackson Cottingham moved here in 1854, he brought 13 children with him. And he also had one more after he got here. So this county used to be quite populated with Cottinghams and also Hamiltons, which is my mother's family. But uh, since then, they've all either died off or moved away, and there's not many of us left anymore. So there's not any Cottinghams in the phone book and very few Hamiltons. I attended McLeansboro Township High School, and then I went to SIU at uh, Carbondale, and where I majored in business education. It was during that time that I met and married my husband, Ron Nelson, who's from Harrisburg originally. Ron is a Baptist minister and also a gunsmith. And right now he's pastoring Long Branch Baptist Church just north of Galatia, and he also has a gunsmith shop behind our house. I work full-time at Physicians Filing Service in Mount Vernon, Illinois. We have two children, Lisa and Ryan, and three beautiful grandchildren. Ron and I have been history buffs for a long time. In fact, we've published several historical books um, like old diaries, old church minutes, early land records, uh, genealogies, and so forth. And uh, Ron's even been on TV a few times being interviewed about his, inter his uh, research that he did on the old slate house. And when the SIU wanted to do their documentary on the river pirates, they asked him if he'd like to be a part of it and so, to come down to Cave and Rock. So he, you can see him in the documentary sitting out on a rock in the Ohio River telling the story of Billy Potts, of the infamous Potts Inn fame just north of Cave and Rock. Um, that, that documentary has been shown on WSIU several times since then. In the first years of our marriage, we moved around quite a bit, but in 1985, we moved back to Hamilton County and immediately joined the Historical Society. Ron became president, and it wasn't long before I was put in as secretary, and I've been secretary ever since. It's been about 25 years, and I can remember only two meetings that I've missed in all that time. I'm also the membership chairperson, so I keep track of our growing list of members which is about quadrupled in the last few years. I also uh, send out meeting notices and membership notices and so forth. And I'm also uh, in charge of the books that the Society has published and has for sale. Um, one of my hobbies is collecting old uh, pictures. I love old pictures and I have uh, one binder of old Hamilton County pictures that I've collected through the years. And I also have a, an extensive collection of old Hamilton County school pictures. Now that collection started several years ago when I wanted to have a display at our fall festival stand and use it as a draw to bring people over to talk to us. So I was able to put together one binder of old school pictures that I found around the library and so forth. And it proved to be quite popular and since then my collection has just kept growing and growing until now I have six binders. And uh, some of them are getting pretty full. I have over 850 pictures, ranging from 1890s to 1960s, uh, maybe some 70s. And people have been very generous about sharing their pictures with me and helping me identify these students. At one time, there was over 100 schools in this county, so there's still a lot out there I don't have. Probably never will have all of them, but it's been fun trying. My association with the Historical Society has been very rewarding and very interesting. The last few years we've tried to be more uh, active in the community, such as doing this cemetery walk and having a stand at the Fall Festival and the flea market. A couple years ago we did a uh, bus tour of the Goshen Trail through the county and on its uh, 200th anniversary of its first mention. We had about 60 people attend that, so we had to have a bus and a van. 
Then last year, we, I participated in a, a photo project that we did of trying to document Hamilton County in 2010. We went all over this county taking pictures, and uh, we've discovered places we didn't know existed. And we had the cops call on us a few times because people didn't know what we were up to. But uh, we took around 3,000 pictures, and we're now in the process of getting them sorted and labeled and put in albums. So eventually we hope to have them on display at the library. Someday these will be old pictures. But uh, my son put them up on his Facebook page, and we've got lots of good comments on those. In fact, we even got a request from a soldier in uh, Afghanistan who's from Hamilton County. He asked us to go out and take pictures of his home place and put them up. So we did that. We took several pictures and put them up, and he commented on all of them and told us that he really appreciated it and that uh, it made him think of home, and he even showed them off to his buddies over there. So if nothing else happened, uh, that one thing was worth our, uh, all the project. And we're happy to be able to do that for him. So I'd like to invite everyone who's interested to come and be a part of our society. We have a lot of fun, and Lord willing, I hope to keep participating for many years to come. Hello, my name is Leland Whiting. I was raised here in McLeansboro, in Hamilton County. And you know, if the present is the strength of our culture, then the past is certainly the lifeblood of our culture. And I certainly feel privileged and honored to be able to participate in this cemetery walk that we're going to be doing on May the 14th. Uh, I will be, uh, uh, my character will be uh, John Wesley Cummins. Now, he touched this community in many ways. Uh, he was the a founder, and they laid the cornerstone of the first United Methodist Church. And that church was the church in which I was raised. My mother played the organ there for about 30 years, and I was raised from a small child uh, in that church, uh, very dear to me. And so I feel honored and privileged to be able to portray John Wesley Cummins. John Wesley was the uh, seventh of ten children, uh, and... Uh, five of which uh, became Methodist ministers. It's a very interesting story and goes back and shows how the history of this county unfolded and was influenced by this man. I came to uh, this uh, county with my parents who came from uh, Kansas and uh, my father uh, uh, was following the oil boom and uh, opened a shop here to uh, service the uh, drilling equipment as this great uh, field was opened up in this area. I was raised here. I entered school uh, at the West Side. My first grade teacher was Miss Laura Lowry, and I continued on through our school system here. Graduated from the then McLeansboro Township High School in 1959. From there, I went on to uh, college uh, in Oklahoma. Graduated with a degree in music education. Uh, later on, I finished my master's degree in computer-aided instruction and have been interested in not only in education but in uh, not the music and the arts, uh, and safety education, in uh, aviation, all of the things that, that affect us in many, many ways. And without the heritage that was given to me by this county and people of this county who touched my life in so many ways, would I have been able to, to do that? I hope that you will all be able to come on May 14th and be with us at our cemetery walk and see exactly how rich a heritage that we have here in Hamilton County. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rick Moore. This is my wife, Bernard Moore. Rick and I have been married for over 40 years and we have two children. Our daughter is, uh, lives in uh, Denver, Colorado with her husband and a four-year-old son. And our son lives in Portland, Oregon. Um, Rick 
has always been interested in history, and I've sort of been along for the ride until last year when, on a whim, I decided to participate in the cemetery walk. And I found out it was just a lot of fun looking at uh, all the information. Um, the lady I portrayed last year was very interesting, and um, just reading the census records and reading the old newspapers was a lot of fun. So I decided that I would go ahead and participate this year. And I uh, portrayed uh, Mary Sabina Carpenter Carner this year. And uh, she was uh, quite um, an elite person in McLeansboro around the turn of the century. And it's uh, very, been very interesting working with her uh, character this year. And like Verna said, I've always been interested in history. We both grew up in the Broken area, uh, right on the county line, and I grew up west of Broken a little ways. But we were gone for about 30 years, and have been back in Hamilton County for 10 years, and have been active in the Hamilton County Historical Society most of that time. Uh, my interest uh, in history came from who knows where, but I've always believed that to know where you're going, you need to know where you're coming from and where you've been researching our characters and as well as many other local history incidents uh, I find very interesting. Um, John Carter, who I portrayed this year, uh, ran a monuments works just off the square in Plainsboro for 60 years. He was born in Perry County but came here with his father who was a Baptist minister. And in fact, uh, his his father married us, my father married us, <laughs> um, but the cemetery walk has uh, generated a lot of interest. Uh, certainly we've enjoyed putting it on as president of the Historical Society. Uh, we hope that you have enjoyed participating in it as much as we've enjoyed putting it on. And certainly we welcome any inquiries you might have as far as uh, membership in the Historical Society or more information about some of the folks portrayed in the cemetery walk. Uh, we'd be more than eager to speak to you about those things. <laughs>